Welcome everyone. I'm Jeremy Druin, manager of the library's Missouri Valley Special Collections. Thank you for joining us, joining us for another online installment of our Signature Sunday series. It seems fitting that on Halloween day, our topic is graveyards, albeit with a twist. Today's program is on ship graveyards. During the 19th century, more than 300 steamboats met their, met their demise at the bottom of the Missouri River. Authors Vicki Irwin and James Irwin researched the counts of these catastrophes, including that of the Arabia, which sank outside Kansas City in 1856. They, de they detail peril perils of 19th century river travel in their book, Steamboat Disasters of the Lower Missouri River. They join us this afternoon from Kirkwood, Missouri to discuss it. Vicki Irwin worked in the publishing industry for more than 30 years including owner and operator of an independent bookstore. She has authored a variety of books ranging from true crime and history to youth mysteries. James Irwin is a practicing attorney in St. Louis for 38 years. He is the author of several books on Missouri's history, including three on the state's Civil War past. This is the second book that the husband and wife team have authored together. Vicki and James, thank you for being here. I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you very much, Jeremy. Vicki and I are very happy to be here to talk to you about steamboat disasters of the Lower Missouri River. Okay, there we go. Imagine you're on the landing at Jefferson City in the 1850s. Steamboat is coming up the river. You can hear it before you can see it. There's a rhythmic can cannonade of exhaust every few seconds. A chug, chug, chug. And over around the bend, you can see smoke and soot shooting out of 50 foot chimneys. Rivermen called smokestacks chimneys, go figure. There's a piercing scream of the steam whistle that announces its arrival. And as the boat approaches the shore, you can hear the boilers pant. You can actually see them visibly expand and contract and you can see the open fires feeding the boilers. The hull twists and bends in the currents, and the whole vessel is creaking and groaning. Heavy machinery is pounding. Just a few inches above the waterline, the deck is littered with stacks of wood, merchandise, bales, bags, horses, cattle, mules, and people. And as the boat gets closer, its thin superstructure is apparent with dozens of passengers crowded on the main deck, and more on the deck above, below a towering pilot, pilot house. It's easy to see why the steamboat was derided in the 19th century as an orderly pile of kindling, and why Charles Dickens, after riding a steamboat to St. Louis, wrote that the wonder is not that there were so many fatal accidents, but that any journey should be safely made at all. And yet, the Western River steamboat that plied the Missouri River from St. Louis to Montana in the 19th century was a technological marvel, superbly adapted to the needs of river transportation during that time. Well, if that's so, why did more than 300 steamboats sink in the Missouri River and the lower Missouri become known as a graveyard for steamboats? Partly what made the Missouri River steamboat successful also made it susceptible to other disasters. But there were other reasons, beginning with the river itself. Ah, uh, the Missouri River. It's used to separate men from boys at the mouth of the Missouri. The boys went up the Mississippi and the men went up the Big Muddy. I've seen nothing more frightful. A mass of large trees and tire with branches came from the Missouri River. The water was all muddy and could not get clear. The Missouri River is too thick to drink and too thin to plow. This picture of the Missouri River that you see on the screen is different from the Missouri River that we wrote about. It's the longest river in North America then as well as now, but today the river's been straightened, it's been cleaned, it's been cleared of debris, and it's been modified in many ways simply to make it safer for navigation. The river's divided into the upper and the lower. Now the upper river is sometimes referred to as the Rocky River and the lower is known as the Sandy River. The Rocky River that runs up through Montana and to the northern reaches 
it's clearer, it flows in a straighter line. But here we're talking about the Sandy River. The banks are unstable. It's deeper, it's wider, it loops and bends, and it's constantly changing. The water moves and so does the sand, and sometimes it moves a lot. For example, Westport, which you some of you may know, oh, Weston. Weston, I'm sorry, Weston, um, was, was an important part, port on the river until the 1870s. And then there came a great flood that changed the channel. And now Weston is two or three miles from the river. It happened so frequently that there had to be a law made governing who owns land when such changes occur. A farmer could have acreage along a riverbank one day and some kind of river changing event could move that acreage to a farm across the river or down the river. The channels along the river are deep, but they're narrow and they're not straight channels. They twist and turn and it makes it very challenging for navigation. That's one of the reasons that riverboat pilots were paid so highly because of their knowledge of these changes in these channels. The banks are tree lined and the swiftly moving river cuts into the soil and it causes those trees to become un unrooted and fall into the river. And this is the biggest danger that steamboats faced. In fact, and you'll hear this from us more than once, these trees known as snags, and you see a huge snag here being pulled from the river caused more steamboat disasters than anything else. Um, as well as being the longest river, as, I, as we just heard, the Missouri is also the muddiest. As Mark Twain said, it's too thin to cultivate and too thick to drink. A little bit about the history of this river. First, of course, it was a home to Native Americans, the Osage, the Missouri, and other tribes. It provided food and transportation, as well as drinking water. They called it the Pecatunoe, meaning muddy water. Father Marquette was the first European to mention it in his writing in 1673, but he didn't explore it at the time, thinking it was too dangerous. Steamboats weren't the first boats to travel the river. Okay, well, you. I'll get to that. Okay. Obviously, others went up the river way before. Native Americans, trappers, traders, Lewis and Clark, and very early settlers. They traveled by canoe and keelboat, but some of these methods of travel on the river were no faster than walking along the banks. Settlers in the Boomslip area along where central Missouri is were especially excited to welcome steamboats. They hoped for a trade increase more settlers due to faster and more reliable transportation. And in 1870, 17, I'm sorry, 1817, the first steamboat arrived in St. Louis, but the first to travel the Missouri was in 1819. It was sponsored by those very Boonslick businessmen who were so hopeful of what steamboats would bring to their area. The name of the boat was the Independence and when it arrived in Franklin, Missouri, they held a seven hour celebration, complete with toasts and food and enough drink to make everyone there thoroughly drunk. The government had planned to be the first to make the trip up the river, but delays caused their expedition, both scientific and military, to be second. This expedition did result in the first disaster one of the boats, the Thomas Jefferson, snagged after traveling only 120 miles upriver and sank. The boat that you see on the screen is the Western Engineer. It had a very unique design. It was designed in this way to look like a sea serpent to frighten and awe the Native Americans who were watching from the shore. It looked like a serpent and it spewed smoke out of a special pipe. After a while, because of all the trouble that the steamboats were having, the military segment of this expedition actually deserted and the boats marched to their destination. The peak of steamboating was the 1840s to the 1860s, approximately when railroads took over. But during the good years, the boats accomplished 
quite a bit. They helped forge the Santa Fe Trail. They moved people toward California and the gold rush, and they especially assisted in Western expansion. The last steamboat involved in trade left the river in 1925. There were still other steam powered boats involved in um, things like clearing the river that didn't leave until later. But let me tell you a little bit about why the design of the boats made disaster also imminent. This is another view of the Western Engineer, which gives you a little bit more uh, complete look at how it was built. Uh, it was not a suitable boat really for the Missouri River and ones like it weren't suitable. The reason was that they were designed, built from designs for ocean going vessels. They had a narrow, deep hull. The passengers, the cargo, and low pressure steam engines were all below deck. They were steered from a rear deck, the poop deck. The paddle wheels were enclosed. It even had a sail, as you can see. And of course, the unique exhaust system designed to frighten the Native Americans. The problem was that this boat uh, could not really overcome the challenges of the Western rivers. The narrow winding channels made sails irrelevant. The uh, high uh, strong currents they had to fight to go upstream made the low pressure steam engines not strong enough to push the boat upstream at any speed whatsoever. And the fact that the depth of the river varied by as much as 35 feet. It could be 35 or 40 feet deep at one point and maybe five or 10 feet deep at another. And a narrow deep hull just wasn't suitable uh, to uh, deal with that kind of uh, conditions on the river. And so within a decade or so, the classic kind of a steamboat design evolved through trial and error. This is the Bertrand, which was built in 1864 and is typical of the kinds of steamboats that plied uh, the Missouri River through most of the 19th century. Uh, the steamboats were very cheap to build. They were built very cheaply with light wood, except for the hulls to save weight and to save money. They had multiple decks. They had a main deck upon which the boiler and the firebox, most of the cargo, the steam engines, and many of the passengers were. Just above that was what was called the boiler deck. Although though the boiler was actually on the main deck, but again, the rivermen had their own unique way of uh, describing some of the features of the boat. Uh, on the main, uh, on the boiler deck would be cabins such as these that would carry passengers who wanted to pay a little bit extra in order to ride in a cabin and not be exposed to the elements here on the main deck. And above that was the hurricane deck on which was located the uh, pilot house, which was located very far forward in order to be able to have good visibility to navigate the river. If the larger boats had yet another deck that was called the Texas deck and the pilot house was located on that. The boats uh, also, this is a, a storm wheeler. Uh, the actual, actually before the Civil War, the preferred mode of uh, building boats was actually side wheelers with the uh, paddle wheels located on the side. The reason being that they were more maneuverable. You could have one paddle wheel going forward and the other one going in, uh, in reverse to the rear and you could turn the boat uh, much easier in the twists and turns of the uh, bends in the river and also in order to uh, make landings. Uh, but stern wheelers uh, became uh, more popular during and after the Civil War, uh, partly because uh, they were shielded from all the debris that would come down the river, the snags and other things that would be in the river. The boat's hull shielded them from those kinds of elements. Whereas if you had a side wheeler, they could get caught up in the paddle wheels and they frequently did, and they could be damaged and have to stop and repair them. All of these boats had a very long, wide, shallow hull. Uh, the reason being that they could carry more weight and uh, they could carry it in a very shallow uh, part of the river. The Bertrand, for example, had a hull that was only five feet deep, but when fully loaded, it drew only four feet of water. Mark Twain, I have to quote him again because we're talking about steamboats and we're talking about rivers. Mark Twain famously declared that a steamboat could run on a heavy dew. George Fitch, another writer about steamboats, was quoted as saying that the steamboat must be so built that when the river is low and the sandbars come out for air, the first mate can tap a keg of beer and run the boat on four miles of foam. The boats also had what are called spars. And these were used to grasshopper or walk the boat over sandbars. 
it'd be low to basically a 45 degree angle and then cranked up with the uh, capstan until they pulled the boat onto the sandbar and then they would raise it up again, put the, the uh, spars down again, pull the boat again forward and until it was finally pulled over the sandbar. This was a much more efficient way of navigating the sandbars than the other two alternatives, one of which involved unloading the boat, going over the sandbar and reloading the boat, very time consuming, or trying to pull the boat over the sandbar with uh, rowboats or whatever else you might've had available, or maybe even uh, animals, <laughs> uh, oxen or mules uh, or horses on the, on the shore. Uh, as I mentioned before, the cargo, the people, the boilers, the fireboxes, the engines were all on the deck rather than below the deck. Now the thin shallow deck made it subject to having the hull punctured by the snags, those trees that were swept off the banks by floods and erosion, and uh, could punch a hole in the bottom of the boat, it could sink in a matter of minutes. These steamboats also had a very powerful high pressure engine, and that became the norm because it was needed in order to push the boats uh, upstream against the powerful currents of the Missouri River. The engines had to be simple, rugged, and easy to repair. And high pressure engines met all of those requirements. It's important that they be easy to repair because in the Missouri River, after you left St. Louis, there were no repair facilities available. And anything that broke or went wrong in the boat had to be repaired by the crews. And it could also had to be easy to operate uh, by persons with little training or experience. Now these uh, steam engines on the boats were tricky to operate. The water, after all, came from the river. The river was the big muddy. And that water, full of mud, sand, and silt, had to be heated in order to convert it to steam. And the boilers easily became clogged with silt and sand, and they had to be cleaned sometimes as often as every 15 hours. There were technological developments used to deal with that including thing, something called the mud drum, which filtered out much of the sand and silt, shown here. This is on the Arabia. Uh, there was also the problem that when they uh, went to landings and the steam engines uh, stopped, the pump stopped <laughs> bringing the water to the boiler, and you had to be very careful to make sure the water didn't get too low. In order to cure that problem, they had what was called the doctor, another pump shown here, which kept running continuously in order to keep the water levels high. They didn't really use steam gauges. They did have uh, steam uh, safety valves and so that if the steam got too high, that would be released and uh, hopefully there would not be an explosion. This is an example of a safety valve. This one again is on the Arabia, but the effectiveness of those safety valves uh, can be determined by the fact they were known in the industry as death hooks. Uh, they could be tied down or jammed and allowed the steam to build up maybe even to dangerous levels in the uh, in the boat. But the improper operation of these, these uh, steam engines could lead to disastrous boiler explosions. Now, as Vicki mentioned, the, the most common cause of uh, sinking on the Missouri River were snags, holes that were ripped in the bottom of the boat by the trees. But there were other, some spectacular boiler explosions on the river. One of them was the big hatching in 1845. Big Hatchie pulled away from the landing at Herman, Missouri. And after these paddle wheel had turned two or three times, there was a huge explosion. Several people were scalded to death. Many others were simply just blown away. 35 unidentified German immigrants, they were unidentified because the records of the boat were lost in the explosion, were buried in Herman, Missouri and this is a monument to them in the cemetery at Herman, Missouri, which you can visit today. Now, for some reason, and the monument, they said the uh, explosion occurred in 1842. It didn't, it was in 1845. Well, in those days, the captain could be charged with a crime for having hired a negligent engineer or a negligently trained or untrained engineer. And the captain of the big hatchie was in fact charged with a crime for that very reason. But when it went to trial, it developed that the engineer was not only highly qualified, but he was not cause of the accident. Nothing he did or failed to do caused it. It turned out that there was a defect in the boiler of the engine, uh, of the steam engine, and that's what exploded. Uh, not so with the next explosion I want to talk about. And this was the worst one that occurred on the Missouri River, the Saluda. 
On Good Friday, 1852, the Saluda uh, pushed off from the landing at Lexington, Missouri, after having made several attempts to try to go upriver. Now, this was a time of uh, what was called the spring rise. The water was high, the current was strong, there was even ice flows in the river. Uh, the captain needed some extra power in order to get away and get up around the bend that was just west of Lexington. They had made multiple attempts to do it in the days ahead or before, but on that morning, they made their last attempt. And as they pulled away, again, the paddle wheels turned two or three times, and then there was a huge explosion shown here. It's not exactly clear what the cause of the explosion was, but it was speculated with some reason that what happened was that the engineer had let cold water into the boilers to create extra steam, and he created far too much steam. In the this tremendous explosion killed 75 passengers and injured many more. Now the citizens of Lexington rallied around the survivors. They buried the dead, they cared for the injured, and some even adopted a couple of the orphan children. The passengers on the Saluda were primarily Mormons who had come from England, Wales, and Scotland. who had gone to uh, New Orleans, up the river to St. Louis, where they had chartered the Saluda to take them up to Campsville, up near Council Bluffs, where they intended to join a wagon train to go on to Utah. Parts of the Saluda remain. If you go to the Lexington Historical Society in Lexington, you can see this door. It was actually taken by Casper Gruber, who bought what was left of the, of the uh, Saluda and built a home <laughs> from the remains of the boat, the wooden remains of the boat, and built this door. Casper Gruber also adopted one of the uh, children who was orphaned by the explosion. The bell was sold to a minister in Savannah, Missouri, and it's still there. It's at the Savannah First Christian Church in Savannah, Missouri, as you can see here on the right. Now, uh, Vicki's gonna tell you about the longest steamboat race. You've heard of the Natchez and the Robert E. Lee going up the Mississippi River. This is about the longest steamboat race, the W.J. Lewis versus the Molly Dozier. We read a lot about a lot of different steamboats when we were doing our research, and some of them came a little bit more alive to us than others did. And my favorite of all the boats was the Molly Dozier. It was captained by Frank Dozier and named after his wife. And this boat had a short, not an unusual thing for a boat to have a short life, but it was very exciting. It experienced fires. It was boarded by Confederates who took um, a Union officer away with them. It was attacked by hostile um, Sioux warriors. And one of the most exciting adventures was this longest steamboat race. Uh, it was between the Molly Dozier and a boat called the William J. Lewis. Now here's a picture of the William J. Lewis. We have looked everywhere to try to find a picture of the Molly Dozier. And if anybody has ever seen a picture of this boat, we would love for you to share it with us. It was 1866 and it was time for that first trip up river to deliver goods from St. Louis to Fort Benton in the Montana territories. The Molly Dozier already had a reputation that it was speedy and it was reliable. But the William J. Lewis was a brand new boat and it was very eager to prove itself as, as a reliable and speedy boat. Um, the trip up river wasn't officially a race, but each of the captains of the ships knew that the first boat to reach Fort Benton would have a trade advantage. On March 27th, both boats were scheduled to take off from the St. Louis landing. But as you know, things often happen and the Lewis left that day at 4.30 p.m. but the Molly didn't leave until the next day. And so it was already behind the William J. Lewis. The Lewis steamed along and thought they were far, far ahead of the Molly until April 15th when the Molly passed the Lewis. To get ahead, the captain of the William J. Lewis took a shortcut down a side channel and came out in front of the Molly Dozier. Now, the two boats stayed fairly even until they reached an island in the middle of the channel. The Molly chose 
the left route and the William J. Lewis chose the right side of the island to go around. And at that point, the Molly Dozier came out ahead. Now still with the lead going back and forth and back and forth, they moved steadily along. Craig Dozier liked to pass the William J. Lewis when it was sitting idle, not exactly idle, but sitting, taking on wood and tooted his horn as they passed by it. When the Lewis was ahead, when they ran into an ice field, remember it was just March on the Missouri River and they were traveling north and it suffered uh, quite a bit of damage to the paddle wheels, making it necessary for them to stop to be repaired. And they were behind again until they came upon the Molly Dozier, which had run aground on a sandbar. Fortunately, it rained that day and the Molly was washed off the sandbar only to land on a second sandbar. She freed herself and sped along, coming upon the Lewis, who was now stuck. It was using a winch line to free itself when that line broke. Bad news for both boats because the current pushed the William J. Lewis backwards and damaged both of the boats. The Lewis finished its repairs first and it steamed into Fort Benton on May 31st at 4.30 a.m. The Molly arrived 33 hours later. It was a nine week trip for the two steamboats. The Lewis actually made $60,000 that trip, which was equal to the cost of what it had taken to build the boat. That was uh, Vicki's favorite story about steamboats. Now I'm gonna tell you my favorite story about one of my favorite captains and one of the boats that he had captained. And one that if you're fortunate in certain conditions, you can still see what's left of it near St. Charles, Missouri. This is the Montana. The Montana is described by uh, at least one writer as a behemoth. It was as long as a football field and as wide as the distance between the hash marks. The Montana carried 100 passengers in luxury in its uh, cabins here on the uh, boiler deck and could carry up to 600 tons of cargo, all while drawing only about four feet of water. The Montana was probably the largest steamboat in the 19th century to ply the Missouri River. Uh, you may be wondering, what are these things here along the, uh, along the edge of the boat, along the side of it? Well, when they carried cattle or horses or mules, they used these as sort of pins to keep them from jumping in the water or uh, you know, causing any problems with that. Well, on uh, the morning of uh, June 22nd, 1884, the Montana was on a run from St. Louis to Kansas City. And it was piloted by one of the legendary captains of the Missouri River, William Rodney Massey. William Rodney Massey, one of my favorites, was born near Herman, Missouri. In fact, he said that uh, he actually started working on the river in the 1840s. And one of the first things he did was help to rescue survivors of the Big Hatchie after that explosion. He not only began working on the river in the 1840s when he was just a youngster, he was a captain still active at the age of 78 when he came to blows with a Captain Grant Marsh, another uh, well-known captain on the Missouri River who was 73 years old. And these two old codgers were duking it out because Massey had, uh, or Grant had criticized the company that Massey was working for. Well, Massey was not only well-known for his prowess as a riverboat captain on the Missouri, but also for his prowess as a gambler. He was playing cards with Wild Bill Hickok in Deadwood, South Dakota in 1876, when Wild Bill was dealt aces and eights and was shot by Jack McCall. The bullet traveled through Wild Bill's skull and lodged in Massey's left wrist. Massey never had the bullet removed and in subsequent years when he arrived at his destination port, he would announce, the bullet that killed Wild Bill is back in town. Well, in the morning of June 22, 1884, all of Massey's skill could not save the Montana. After it pushed off from the landing below the, the uh, St. Charles Railroad Bridge, it got caught in an eddy around one of the pillars, crashed into it, and sank. Now, Massey was able to get the boat over to the shore, and there were no casualties but the boat itself was a total loss. Within weeks, it was uh, salvaged everything 
from the water line up it was taken away. The boilers, the engine, the furniture in the cabins, all the wood that composed the superstructure, the paddle wheels, everything. Nothing was left but a piece of the hull on the bottom of the river. A few months later, John Gonzalez, was a cap who was a captain of the sister ship, the Dakota, a boat very much like the uh, Montana, struck a snag near Providence Bend. Massey asked how Gonzalez could have failed to see a stump that was prominent as the one that was there, which all of the captains knew about. To which Gonzalez replied, well, the stump wasn't nearly as prominent as the St. Charles Railroad Bridge. But when the river is very, very, very low, and I understand that probably was five or six years ago, and certainly was very low in 2002 when marine archaeologists came from uh, to study the Montana, you can see what's left of it. And its hulk rises like a ghost from the river. And you can see what's left of one of the mightiest boats ever to sail the Missouri River, the Montana. Well, now, some of you may be thinking, what in the world ever possessed Jim and Vicki to take up this study of steamboat disasters? Um, one weekend, Jim and I took a weekend trip to Hannibal, Missouri, and we happened upon a display of artifacts from a steamboat that had sunk and had been excavated and was uh, traveling around on display and there were future things in store for it. Well, this was the Arabia. When we went through their little gift shop that was outside of it, we found these maps and the maps had every steamboat wreck that had happened marked on the on the thing. And we were just like, oh my goodness, look at all those, those wrecks. Wouldn't that be interesting to know what happened to each and every one of those? And in the, this was, many years ago and it wasn't as easy to find out information then as it is now and we would have had to travel to every little town along the way to kind of find out what was going to happen and once we retired and newspapers.com and other resources were available online we decided that we would kind of indulge ourselves and look into this whole idea of steamboat disasters on the missouri river uh, one of the things that happened in the course of, of our research was that we wanted to travel to different places and um, do our research right on site. Well, this was the year that there were big floods. And so we could get as far as St. Joseph, but if we ever tried to go north of St. Joseph, the roads were closed and we couldn't get to some of the places that we wanted to see. The Bertrand that Jim showed you a picture of earlier was one of the places we wanted to go and we still have not made it there after the floods and COVID and everything else that's happened. But we're, of course, it was the Arabia that inspired our very first interest in the whole idea of steamboat disasters. And even though it was our way into this study, it wasn't the first steamboat that kind of enticed treasure hunters. It is by now the most well known. It also wasn't the first to be excavated. The Bertrand that I've now mentioned about four times was um, was that boat. It was it's in Nebraska. It's a national park. National Wildlife Refuge. National Wildlife Re Refuge. They um, excavated the boat. They removed everything from the boat, and then they re. Then they they buried the hull. They buried yeah. the hull back where it was. And, and just a little little factoid about the the uh, Bertrand. The captain of the Bertrand when it sank was a man named Horace Bixby, who, if you've read Life on the Mississippi, you'll know is the captain who taught Mark Twain, then Samuel Clemens, uh, how to be a pilot on the Mississippi River. So anyways, the, the Bertrand is there and it's an, it's another place you can go and look. The men who were involved in the excavation of the Bertrand also searched at one time for the Arabia. Now there's many stories of treasure buried on the muddy bottom of the Missouri River, but interestingly enough, it wasn't gold that some of those early treasure hunters were looking for, it was whiskey. Um, that's how they were planning to make their fortunes. Anyone who found whiskey, and there's several stories in the book about this, 
ran into many other problems from um, the walls collapsing as they excavated to not being able to pay the taxes on the whiskey that was on that was still on the boat. One of the big problems that I mentioned early on was that the river moves and it changes constantly. And in the case of the Arabia, the treasure or the ship are no longer even in the river. Now, the Arabia sank on September 5th, 1856. And this is the, the snag that was the villain of the story. And it's the one that punched the hole in the bottom of the boat and caused it to sink. It carried 130 passengers and it had 200 tons of freight aboard. After it hit the snag and started to sink, the passengers quickly walked off the boat and they were sent to Parkville, Missouri, where they spent the night and then found another way to take their journey onward to wherever they were headed. Their suitcases and trunks were also unloaded before the boat sank and left on the bank overnight. Unfortunately, thieves found those suitcases and trunks and they stole everything of value out of them. So that was a big loss for the passengers. Uh, by the next morning, there was no loss of life, fortunately, except, mule. except for this poor mule. Now, the mule owner claimed that he tried to entice the mule off the ship, but it wouldn't come. But when the skeleton was excavated, it was found that there was still a tether attached to its harness and it was tied and would not have been able to get off the ship, off the boat. These are boats, these are not ships. Um, the next morning after everyone was off the boat, the ship had dis the boat had disappeared. It was just eaten up by the sand. Um, this meant a very rough river, a uh, very rough winter for those people in Nebraska who were waiting for all the supplies that were aboard the Arabia. And it even meant that one town that was waiting for these supplies, um, the people just up and moved out across the river to get what they needed. Also, the crew of the boat lost their jobs and the boat itself was a total loss. Now, it wasn't easy to find this boat when they were ready to excavate and it was not easy to excavate. Others had looked for the Arabia before, so the Hollies and their company did have some idea of where it was found, and here's a picture of, of where it was. Once they found it, they were in a constant battle with water. You can see in this picture of the excavation site, they were in a constant battle with water. They would dig and water would fill up the hole. They would dig and water would fill up the hole. This. Um, meant that they had to install pumps and more pumps and then some more pumps. And it meant that there was more fuel that needed to be used. And that meant that there was more money to be spent. They went, the Hollies and their company went into this search thinking they'd spend about $250,000, but they'd spent that before they even found the Arabia. And they ended up spending millions of dollars. Earlier in their endeavor, the group uncovered a steamboat called the Missouri Packet. Now, the way that they excavated this particular boat was using heavy machinery. The Missouri Packet was one of the very early steamboats on the Missouri River, probably from as early as the 1820s, and it was one of the first to sink. It would have been an extremely valuable historical find but it was destroyed in the way that it was excavated. Uh, the team claimed that they used the machinery in the interest of time and money. And after they destroyed the boat, they found nothing of value and they abandoned the search. The engine from the Missouri packet is on display at the Arabia Museum. It also caused a rift between team members and two of the team left to do their own explorations. Uh, this team found a boat called the Twilight, and it still had whiskey on board, but that's another story that you can read in the book. 
there's a lot of technical stuff about the excavation of the, the uh, Arabia and how it was accomplished and how much it cost. But what I kind of took away was that the work was physically hard. It was very cold because all the work was done in the winter to protect the artifacts. It was muddy. It was wet. It was expensive. It was sometimes frustrating. And it meant the men had to be away from their family for long amounts of time. Yet, when they discovered that first cache of artifacts, the elation of that find wiped everything out. After that, as one of the men said, every day was like Christmas. And once they had the artifacts, they had to store them. They had to restore some of them and they had to preserve them. They'd been in a perfect preservation environment for over a hundred years, also something you can read about in the book. And so they had to store them in a similar environment. So some of them went into freezers and coolers that belonged to one of the team members who owned a restaurant. And they also rented a cave for other artifacts that needed further um, measures to preserve them. That preservation process was another thing they had to overcome. None of the team had any experience in preserving artifacts. And although they have much experience now, because they had no credentials and they hadn't followed archaeological protocols, professionals were unwilling to help them. They finally found people in Canada and England who gave them information and, and advice that they needed to do the work necessary to create the museum. What the team ended up with was a treasure in the form of gold. In fact, they found 26 and a half cents on board the Arabia, but a perfectly preserved example of how people lived in the 1850s down to what kind of food they ate. And when all was said and done, the salvors, and that's the preferred term to treasure hunter, decided the value of all of these goods wasn't in money, but what they could get if they, which would be what they would get if they sold the artifacts, but it was in the story that it told. Even the landowner whose land the art, the Arabia had uh, been under for all these years and who was promised a share of um, the, the proceeds, decided he only wanted one item out of the collection for each member of the family. And he only wanted items that there were duplicates of. So to tell this very important story, the team opened the Arabia Steamboat Museum in Kansas City, which I'm sure many of you have visited. We visited it several times and they were very helpful to us in the course of writing our book. Now today, as a result somewhat of the Arabia excavation, there's new laws that govern shipwrecks and recovery. Mostly um, some, just a few of the things that have changed. There now must be an archaeologist on site to record and follow protocol, make sure all the protocols are followed. There's many, many permits that have to be acquired along the way. There's limits on who the artifacts can be sold to, I mean, and many other things. And in fact, um, the Twilight boat that I talked about earlier, uh, one of the reasons that it took so long for them to finish their excavation was because they were subject to all these laws. The team for, Jim's going to talk to you about something yeah. else. Well, the Ar Arabia Museum, we've heard the rumors, and I guess we're cleared for rumor and so are you. We've heard that the Arabia's lease will be up in a few years and they may or may not be looking for a new spot to move to. Every place we went to do research told us that they we're going to come there. St. Yeah. Joseph, Jefferson City, St. Charles, they all said, uh, oh, the Arabia is going to come here. Yeah, so. <laughs> even, even down at I-70 and 65. Well, well, if it does move, and uh, I hope that wherever it moves, it's somewhere in Missouri and preferably somewhere on or near the Missouri River. Um, the team from the Arabia are actively looking for other boats to excavate. Uh, one of the first ones they've been looking for is the Malta, which is located near Malta Bend in central Missouri. It's named after the Malta that sunk there. And uh, they use sophisticated metal detecting instruments to uh, locate what they believe is to be the site of the Malta. And you can see from this photograph where it apparently is 
in the middle of a soybean field this time, uh, not that far from the Missouri River. You can see it there in the background. Uh, they may also be looking for a boat called the Radnor, which uh, sank in 1846, taking military supplies up to Fort Leavenworth uh, for, uh, to build up the army for the uh, uh, war between uh, the United States and Mexico. Uh, either the Malta or the Radnor, or perhaps both, may be the next big find of steamboats in the country. Uh, now the golden era of steamboats extended from the 1840s to basically the end of the Civil War. Why did it end? Well, we can give you one word, railroads. Railroads began to replace steamboats as the principal mode of transportation, not only in the East and Northeast, but also in the Midwest, West and the South. The railroad built bridges across the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. The railroads weren't confined to the major rivers. The rails could be laid anywhere there was a need. They could travel directly across the country. They could cross mountain ranges and they could carry just as much freight and passengers more quickly, if not always more safely than the steamboats. The railroads were in short, more efficient and more flexible. Now there are, uh, you can still see steam engines from the days, the heydays of the railroads. And, what? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, maybe you saw the big boy. Did it come through your town? It came through our town uh, about a month or two ago. And uh, you can go to the National Transportation Museum in St. Louis. And there are other places around the country where steam engines have been preserved and places where steam engines are actively operating as uh, tourist railroads. I don't know of any similar uh, steamboat from the 19th century that's been preserved or is operating. There are fortunately, however, museums like the Arabia Steamboat Museum and the one for the Bertrand, uh, which do preserve an important part of the growth of this country, the steamboats. You had something you wanted to add? Oh, okay. Well, that's basically the end of our presentation. We'd be glad to take any questions you may have. And uh, shall I stop to share then? Th thank you, Vicki and James. Uh, very interesting. and. And I invite our audience to uh, submit questions and just put those right in the uh, in the comments, and we will we will get to them. Uh, I'll I'll start off with the first one. Um, in your research, did you get a sense for the the lifespan of steamboats that navigated the Missouri River? I mean, being it's so treacherous. Yes, uh, the average lifespan of a steamboat on the Mississippi River was six years. I'm getting ready okay. to. The average, the average lifespan of a steamboat on the Mississippi River was six years, but on the Missouri River, it was only three years. And uh, that uh, illustrates that the Missouri River was a place where the men went up at the mouth rather than the boys. Right. And, and I, I found it interesting when you referenced, uh, you know, in engineers that were found negligent. Mm -hmm. uh, did was that was that common or fairly rare? I, I I would think that maybe negligent would be you know maybe someone was inebriated or I mean, they, they, maybe that somehow that might be hard to prove of a negligent engineer. Well, they they usually took the blame if there was a boiler explosion uh, because they were obviously the ones in charge of uh, of that. Um, I think uh, there was a concern. There were some serious boiler explosions that occurred on the Mississippi, a whole series of them in one year in the 1830s, which led to the first passage of safety laws by the federal government. And that, that's the one that the big hatchy captain was tried under. Um, the, the difficulty was that the, there wasn't any really any training for the, the engineers. It was sort of an on the job training kind of a thing. There was no certification for them until much later. Uh, there was no certification for pilots until much later. Uh, it was, uh, you know, you learned how to do it by doing it. And uh, if you didn't learn properly or if you made a mistake, and, and, and of course the technology was, was rather crude, shall we say. Uh, there weren't steam gauges to see how much steam pressure you had in your boiler. So how did you know if you had too much? Uh, you know, yeah, well, maybe if you had too much, the uh, the safety valve went off, but you know maybe maybe you tied it down. In which case, you wouldn't know. 
Also, can you speak to the uh, the the size of a crew, the crew on a uh, on a I guess an average steamboat? Uh, well, of course, it would vary based upon the size. There would be uh, a captain who was basically the uh, kind of the business guy, and he had a clerk who assisted him. It was also the business to get in the cargoes and the passengers. The pilot. There might have been two pilots on the boat who was in charge of navigation. There would be a mate who would be in charge of the deck crew, the engineer who was in charge of the, uh, the you know, the, the boilers and the steam engine and so forth. And then there would be a, a deck crew who would be uh, some who would be used to uh, feed the wood into the into the fireboxes, others who would uh, put the cargo on and off the boats. Uh, it would vary maybe 10 or 15 maybe 20, if larger boats would have more, boats that had more elaborate cabins would have- uh, uh, Service people. Service people, cooks, or uh, you know, people who would serve uh, the uh, cabin passengers at least uh, with their food and take care of their cabins and that sort of thing. And also the captain was some, oftentimes the owner yeah. or a part owner of the boat. Right. Okay. We do have some audience questions coming in uh, having to do with, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, aspects to research of, of these books. Um, someone asked during your research, were there just some questions that you just couldn't find answers for um, maybe because of just lack of information available, research material available, uh, anything that's, that, that stands out that you just uh, were looking for a piece of information but couldn't find it? Well, we couldn't find that picture of the Molly Dozier, <laughs> which I, you know, seriously, I mean, we really, really wanted a picture of that. Or there's another boat I really liked called the New Lucy that we never found a picture of. Um, there's a collection at the State Historical Society in Columbia called the E.B. Trail. And E.B. Trail was a dentist in Berger, Missouri, and he spent a huge portion of his life researching steamboats and he had so much information and everything from Christmas cards with pictures of steamboats on them to you know uh, actual bills of lading from you know the, the steamboats uh, that was a, a just a golden source of information but for me it was that Molly Dozier picture that's kind of the thing that's escaped. What about you, Jim? Well, there were, you know, things, boats that we were interested in that uh, you maybe would find one or two things in the newspapers about it, but you couldn't really find much in the way of details as far as what happened to it or what would kind of, you know, what kind of car cargo was it carrying or why did it sink and it'd say, well, it sank or maybe it struck a snag, but that's all you would know and maybe a date. Um, and by the way, the, the trail collection, I have to take my hat off to EB Trail. You know, we got most of our photographs digitally. They were either available on the internet or archives would digitize them and, and make them available to us. EB Trail got his photographs in the days when you had to get photographs, actual photographs. There are hundreds of them in his collection in, in the State Historical Society. And so uh, he had he, copious correspondence with people yes. collecting those those photographs. Right. And so it was uh, oh, that if you're interested in steamboats, that's the first place to go to get to get primary material. But uh, it's interesting, interesting you say that because our next question was uh, they thank you for the presentation. Uh, what research organization and, and and or city location has the best um, primary source information regarding steamboats and their and their cargo the state historical society are there any others that you you drew upon uh, any other organizations collections yeah, the uh, museum in herman the museum in herman has some things uh some photographs and other items the we missouri, got things from in kansas city too yeah the missouri historical society um, um oh uh we found well. We found the one the the painting of the Western engineer. We found in St. Joseph. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, there there are those are probably the major collections. I guess the Library of Congress would have some things yeah, as well. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Newspapers.com is uh, was an important source for us uh, because the, you know you could get contemporary accounts 
of uh, steamboat disasters of various types. And there were some books. There's an older book, a very old book by a man named Lewis Hunter, which I think is still in print. You can still get it. And it has everything you would want to know about the operation of steamboats from how they were built to how they were operated, the business aspect of it. Uh, it was a very, very helpful source. So um, we, we haven't, uh, yeah, she's looking at her book. And well, our, our I bibliography- looking, I was looking for that, the, the river book that, that, you know, about the river. And I can't think of it, what the exact title of it is right now. Oh, uh, well, you'll, you'll find, oh, you mean the one about the navigation in the Missouri River? It could be that, but well, it was, it was there's, so there's several, but yeah, if you are, if you get the book, the bibliography uh, is uh, pretty complete in terms of what we found. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you are. Find it at bookshop.org and other bookstores. Right. I, I, you know, I, you mentioned rumors of the Steamboat Arabian Museum possibly relocating, and it, it's a true tr treasure here in Kansas City, and we, we you know, we should rally around it and to keep them here. Um, and, so, and, and which was someone's a question and comment uh, that it, saying that the, the Arabia for a lot of Kansas Cityans is a is a hidden treasure. A lot of a lot of maybe people locally haven't been there. Uh, what would you say to encourage people to visit um, who may have lived here their entire life but but never been to that museum? It's like us in the arch. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just always there. But I mean, we've been three times. At least, yeah. at least three times to the Arabia, and we've listened. We've heard um, when, whenever when the book, when their book came out, Treasure from the Cornfield yeah. came out. They came here to the St. Louis area, and they spoke. And so we also had that. And uh, I mean, our book had a small section on the Arabia. I mean, there is so much more to know. They, you know, there's you can watch preservation going on there. You can see uh, all the. You would just be amazed at, for example, how many pairs of shoes there are. Yeah. And you look at that display of all those shoes or all those dishes. And well, I was I was impressed by the ring of keys. Yeah. <laughs> and also by the doorknobs. Yes. Doorknob, just like going to Walmart, only it was in the in the nineteenth century. I mean, anything you would want was on that boat. Anything you needed to live you know, in a town in the 19th century was on that boat, anything, even food. It, it's just fascinating. And of course we are big history nerds. So that, <laughs> that makes a difference, but it is, you can just, I, I just felt immersed in, in it and walk out with such a good feeling. You know, your point is a good one. Oftentimes you maybe don't appreciate the museum, you know, you visit museums outside of the area when you're on vacation and visiting other parts of the state and country, but sometimes you don't always appreciate the museums and, you know, right here in your backyard and, and other attractions. Well, it's just always there and you're always like, I'll get there someday, you know, because they know, you know that it's still there, but it, it's very worth a visit. It's worth very a visit, worth yes. I, I agree. Uh, let's look at another audience question come in. Um, let's see, documentation on, um, on what the, is there documentation uh, about what the river looked like uh, before the core, core channelized the river? Uh, well, actually the maps that Vicki referred to earlier, uh, there's a series of, I think, 14 maps from Omaha to the mouth of the Missouri River. I bought them all at the, uh, at the Arabia Steamboat Museum. But what they have in there is a, uh, it, it has the channel as it was in 1879 and superimposed on that was the channel as it was in 1954. I'm not sure why they picked those two dates, I guess because the Corps of Engineers had actually mapped them during those two dates. And superimposed on that are where all of the steamboat wrecks are. And you can see that many of them like the Arabia are no longer in the channel of the river. Uh, or at least the channel of the river was in 1954, which I think probably hasn't changed all that much from then till now. Um, and uh, there is that. Uh, so uh, that's available. And then also available, I think, at the Missouri, Hist or no, I'm sorry, the State Historical Society, they have the older map that this was taken from. It was actually done by uh, Captain Henry, Henry 
Henry Chittenden, Chittenden. Yeah. Chittenden in 1897, who actually made the list of the 300 wrecks or so, uh, the first comprehensive list that uh, were also used. And uh, that's actually available, uh, oh, I think from online, if we've got a Library of Congress or someplace like that. Uh, so there are, there are some maps. The ones on, in the State Historical Society, I have to say, are a little hard to see online. You'd have to see them actually in person to really get it. If you go to the Arabia Museum, though, they do have these other maps, and they're actually in color. And uh, it's, uh, it's very surprising how much it's changed. I've seen similar maps uh, for uh, that compared the river when Lewis and Clark went up to, come to what it is today. And uh, the river changed dramatically, well, especially from Lewis and Clark, but also dramatically from the 19th century, the late 19th century. Well, Vicki and James, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been a, a fascinating uh, presentation. I'd like to also thank our, our audience. Um, Steamboat uh, Disasters, you can find that at bookshop.org and other outlets. And I think uh, we should encourage everyone to uh, visit the Steamboat Arabia Museum here in Kansas yes. City. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you. you, Jeremy. It was great. Thank you.